My name is Jim Fleming, and this is Our Sunday School. Our Sunday School is part of Stewart Heights Baptist Church in Chattanooga, Tennessee. To prepare for this lesson, please go to OurSundaySchool.com for a copy of today's handout. Now, let's get to this week's lesson. Well, good morning, and welcome to Our Sunday School. Glad you guys are with us this morning. Welcome to everybody online. Glad you guys are with us. Uh, we are in Mark chapter 15 this morning. Uh, I kind of freaked out just a minute ago. I was uh, talking to Zeke, and apparently I was waving my arms pretty good, and one of my, my page in my Bible flipped over. When I looked down just a second ago, it was open to Luke. I was like, what, is, what is this? Like, I don't know. That's not in the schedule. <laughs> like, what's going on? So my heart rate's back down to normal now, so we'll get started with the lesson. So. But uh, glad you guys are with us this morning. So uh, last week, we uh, began the first five verses of Luke's Gospel, and we'll make reference to some things that we talked about last week, but um, I'm excited about getting into, in today's text, one of my favorite characters in all of the Gospel, uh, Barabbas. And I don't know if you have studied much on him or researched him or uh, spent any time on his life, but uh, fascinating stuff. And he, for me, was one of the linchpins that helped me to understand the political dynamics in what was going on at the time of Jesus. Uh, so I'm, I'm looking forward to getting to talk about that this morning. So let's go ahead and read through uh, Mark chapter 15. So Mark 15. And as soon as it was morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council. And they bound Jesus and led him away and delivered him over to Pilate. And Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? And he answered him, You have said so. And the chief priests accused him of many things. And Pilate again asked him, Have you no answer to make? See how many charges they bring against you. But Jesus made no further answer, so that Pilate was amazed. Now at the feast he used to release for them one prisoner for whom they asked. Among the rebels in prison who had committed murder in the insurrection, there was a man called Barabbas. And the crowd came up and began to ask Pilate to do as he usually did for them. And he answered them, saying, Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? For he perceived that it was out of envy that the chief priests had delivered him up. But the chief priests stirred up the whole crowd to have him released for them, to have them released for them Barabbas instead. And Pilate again said to them, Then what shall I do with the man you call the king of the Jews? And they cried out again, Crucify him. And Pilate said to them, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Crucify him. So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released for them Barabbas. And having scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. And the soldiers led him away inside the palace, that is, the governor's headquarters. And they called together the whole battalion, and they clothed him in a purple cloak, and twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on him. And they began to salute him, Hail, King of the Jews. And they were striking his head with a reed, and spitting on him, and kneeling down in homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the purple cloak, and put his own clothes on him. And they led him out to crucify him. And they compelled a passerby, Simon of Cyrene who was coming in from the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to carry his cross. And they brought him to the place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull. And they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him and divided his garments amongst them, casting lots for them to decide what each should take. And it was the third hour when they crucified him. And the inscription of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. And with him they crucified two robbers, one on his right and one on his left. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, Aha, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. So also the chief priests with the scribes mocked him to one another, saying, He saved others, he cannot save himself. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him also reviled him. And when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lema sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? 
And some of the bystanders hearing it said, Behold, he is calling Elijah. And someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink, saying, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion, who stood facing him, saw that in this way that he breathed his last, he said, Truly, this man was the Son of God. There were also women looking on from a distance, among whom were Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, the younger, and of Joseph and of Salome. When he was in Galilee, they followed him and ministered to him. And there were also many other women who came up with him to Jerusalem. And when evening had come, since it was the day of preparation, that is the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a respected member of the council, who also was himself looking for the kingdom of God, took courage and went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. And Pilate was surprised to hear that he should have already died. And summoning the centurion, he asked him whether he was already dead. And when he learned from the centurion that he was dead, he granted the corpse to Joseph. And Joseph bought a linen shroud, and taking him down, wrapped him in the linen shroud and laid him in a tomb that had been cut out of the rock. And he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of Joseph saw where he was laid. Mark chapter 15. Again, a heavy text to see what happened to our Lord Jesus Christ. But this morning, let's start with verse 6 in Mark chapter 15. It says, Now at the feast. So let's pause. We've got a noun. What feast are we talking about? Passover feast, right? So this was a, an extended uh, event. Uh, one of the largest events that would have occurred in Jerusalem at the, at the, during a given year. So the feast, now th there's, I want you to look at your handout on page 515, the first page of the handout today. There's no article in Greek. And you might think, well, what in the world does that have to do with anything? All right, so when you don't have an article in front of a noun, it may not, not always, because... The Bible writers, and like, don't tell your kids this, but the Bible writers didn't always use flawless grammar. Okay? Like, it's just, it's not. Some of it's very casual. Some of it, if they put it in front of a Greek teacher or professor at the time, they would have marked them off for some uh, lack of detail here and there. But there's no article here which, which to a first century uh, Jew could have very easily implied that this was uh, generically referring to all feasts. Now, the challenge is that it's a singular feast. It's a singular noun. So you, you could interpret it, and there are actually some English translations that, uh, that would suggest that for all the major Jewish feasts, this was a tradition that Pilate would have done. Which brings us to an interesting question, like, why would that be an interpretation that you would adopt? So I want to I pause for just a second. Um, <laughs> I don't know that I've ever took as long of an excursus because of a lack of an article as I'm about to, but here we go. So Dave, if you could hit the next slide for me. I want to talk about Jewish insurrections. Um, so at the time of Jesus, and really from the time that... Uh, Israel began to be invaded, which was over and over and over again. They would just swap out one ruler for another ruler, one ruler for another ruler, all kinds of stuff. The Jewish people did not take kindly to being invaded, right? So here's what would typically happen. There would be some type of oppression, and then that would lead to a revolt from the people. And the revolt would lead to additional oppression, and the oppression would lead to revolt. And this cycle just continues over and over and over. And th like, this is what's happening in the background during all of the ministry of Jesus. And the crazy thing is that like, during the actual life of Jesus was one of the quietest times in all of this cycle. It was a, a really big lull in the actual wars. Uh, there was a war between the Jews and Rome in 66 A.D., Anybody want to guess who won? It wasn't the Jews, right? 
I mean, this is just, it's unbelievable, right? So you, you can even, if you know your Old Testament history, you can go back and look at the Old Testament stories uh, in the Apocrypha, uh, the Maccabean revolts, right, to pushing up against those invaders that had came in their country. This, is, this has been going on for centuries when we get to Jesus, and it was going on in the background. So a lot of uh, commentators and, and theologians who understand the political ramifications would lean even farther into this lack of an article that Pilate might be doing something on a fairly regular basis to placate the crowd, to help them just settle down. Okay, we captured one of your insurrectionists, and we're going to let them go so that we kind of settle everything a little bit. So think about what's happening right now at the border of Ukraine. There is, I would imagine, and I pray, a spectacular amount of negotiation going on. Some that we know about, I would imagine a large amount that we don't know about, between lots of different countries trying to keep war at bay. So very similar kind of concept. So Pilate is this guy stuck in the middle, right? He's not Caesar. He's not in charge of all of Rome. He's the governor of backwoods Judea. Like, it's not your dream assignment. Like, you don't grow up, I want to be the governor of Judea. It's like, no, you really don't. <laughs> you want to kind of get out of that job as quickly as you can. And Pilate had a history, as we talked about last week, of putting down insurrections very hard. Right? So he was already kind of in trouble with the Caesar because he had done this a couple of times, and a lot of historians believe that Pilate was really on his last strike at this point. So he doesn't have a lot of other opportunity to make things good with the Jews because you've got to live with them. He's literally, you're in their country. It's his country, but you're in their country. So there's this wonky balance that he's trying to work through. So all that to say, there very easily could have been this might have been something he did on more occasion than just the Passover. So if he did, I want you to have this background, but we're going to come back to this in just a second. All right, so here we go. Now at the feast, he used to release, and this is an imperfect tense, so this is repeatedly happening in past time. So this could refer just to Passover or to other as well. He used to release for them one prisoner for whom they asked. And a, a, a better way to translate that word for ask would be to beg. Um, there's other Greek words that mean to ask. This is a much more passionate, uh, begging type mentality. And I'm just going to take one more dig at Pilate here. How weak of a leader are you when you require your people to repeatedly beg for something to give it to them? Like this is, nobody wants to work for anybody that behaves like this. This is just really, really uh, shameful leadership. So then we get to verse 7. And among the rebels in prison, among the rebels, so we're, in, we're talking about the people who have revolted at this point. So there's been some type of mini revolt, and they've captured people because of this, among the rebels in prison, who had committed murder. Now, the English translation does something wonderfully helpful for us here. So there's a comma after prison, and there's a comma after insurrection. And when you set a phrase off with commas around it, it is not necessary for the understanding of the entire sentence, right? I don't know if you remember this rule from English class way back when, but Zeke's like, nope, not over, okay. The beautiful thing here is that in Greek, this phrase, who had committed murder in the insurrection, is not directly tied to Barabbas. It's talking about the rebels in prison. And if you run past this really quick, you can get the impression that Barabbas was actually a murderer. And he might have been, but the way this text is constructed does not explicitly state that. So, if you're going to put down a revolt who do you go after in the revolt? If you're the people doing the oppressing, who do you go after in the revolt? The leaders. The leaders. That's exactly right. right. 
So that kind of a concept and Pilate's history, his very long history of going after very specific leaders in revolts, leads, no pun intended, a lot of people to believe that Barabbas actually led the revolt that Mark is talking about right here. And Pilate is trying to put the leader of this revolt up against this person in whom he can find no fault. And to the people who would have loved what Barabbas was doing, because he's trying to overthrow Rome, throw off the shackles of Rome, this actually wasn't a hard decision. Does this make sense? Does it resonate? All right. I feel like Paul Harvey here with this rest of the story kind of this morning. And I, I always, always, always get super concerned whenever I hear somebody teach the Bible in the way that I'm doing right now. Like, I want to give you all this additional context that the Scripture actually doesn't say. But like I said a couple of weeks ago, I don't think Mark actually understood that somebody's going to be reading this a couple of thousand years later. He wrote this for people who were alive at the time trying to communicate what was going on. He wrote it less than, you know, we think 20 years after it actually happened. People would have remembered the specific insurrection that is going on right here. So, it's back to the text for just a sec. So, and among the rebels in prison who had committed murder in the insurrection, there was a man called Barabbas. Now, don't miss, don't miss, the, the word play that Mark uses here. So he's talking about someone who, who is grouped with murderers and somebody who is being actively murdered in the process, so Jesus. So see the, the, the opposites that are taking place. All right, one more thing. Let's talk about Greek for just a second. The name Barabbas. So look at, look at your hand out there. So it says Barabbas. The definition means son of Abba. What does Abba mean? Father. Father. Yes, we all got this one. Excellent. Sean McGarvey did a fantastic job on Romans 8 several years ago. Son of Abba. Anybody want to make a really simple theological leap with the comparison that Mark is making between Jesus and Barabbas at this point? Like, it's just shockingly simple, right? Now, the funny thing is, most people think that Mark was written to a very Gentile or Roman-oriented audience. I think he may have been. The Romans would not have gotten that. It would have gone completely over their heads. They were not looking for the son of the father. That is not how Jesus is actually described in Mark's gospel. but it's a really interesting thing. Now, you were named after your dad in Jewish culture, or you were named after the town that you're from in Jewish culture. But do you know what rabbis had a nickname for in the towns they served? The rabbis were very often known as Abba. And that little tendency has actually hung around in the Catholic Church. Father, so-and-so, right? There are a lot of scholars who believe that Barabbas' dad was actually a rabbi. Kind of neat, right? It's like, okay, well, let's keep rolling with this. Now, the, the real question for me is, if his daddy was a rabbi, what does daddy think about him getting arrested for insurrection to Rome? I don't know. That would have been a cool conversation to have, right? So verse 8, and the crowd came up and began to ask, and the, the word Pilate is actually not in this sentence right there, um, but the English translations supply it because otherwise it gets very complicated trying to figure out who's talking to who. They began to ask Pilate, as to do as he usually did, and again, this is the imperfect tense, this is repeated action, to do as he usually did for them. And then verse 9, and he, Pilate, so the, the ESV does the opposite here, they put he in where the word Pilate is actually clearly in the original language. So I, 
I would love to have a conversation with the translation committee for like 30 seconds. They're like, why did you switch it here and not switch it here? I, I get it. Part of the translator's job is to make it smooth and flow in English. Um, so there's that. So he answered them saying, and notice the present active participle. This is a repeated conversation. Do you want or wish, this might be my favorite word in Mark's gospel. So what do you, what do you delight in? Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? And this was Pilate's favorite phrase for Jesus, which I got to wonder every time that he used it, if he wasn't just making a little dig at Herod, because they didn't get along at all until it came to Jesus. And we find out in one of the other gospels that over Jesus, they actually finally bonded. They got together. Everything was good. But they were not friends before Jesus, which is kind of interesting. And then we have this parenthetical in verse 10. For he, Pilate, perceived, and this is the imperfect again, so repeatedly perceived, that it was out of envy. And this out of is the Greek preposition dia, which means through. It was through envy or jealousy that the chief priests had delivered him up. I won't go into what the pluperfect is. It's basically a, fa it's a fancy past tense, so I'm, it's not overly important for this particular translation, but, but Pilate was savvy enough to see what was actually going on politically. So we, we get a little glimpse into the fact that, okay, he, he did understand a few things about how things work. Right? You, you don't get appointed to be a governor over a Roman province unless you have a little bit of political savvy. So he's, he can see through some of this stuff, right? So we get to verse 11, but the chief priests stirred up the crowd. So why would the chief priests do this? I don't think it's a complicated answer, but what, like, why would the chief priests do this? Yeah, they can. This, this is their goal all along, right? They've been, they've been waiting for this opportunity. They, they, they've schemed, they've planned, they've bribed Judas. They've been working for years to get Jesus taken off the scene and here, all of a sudden, Pilate looks like he's about to screw the whole thing up for him. Like, what are you doing, man? I, I, I find it incomprehensible that Caiaphas, the high priest, wouldn't have had a conversation with Pilate about this situation. Like, Pilate hired Caiaphas. Seems like arch enemy number one to Caiaphas would have come up in a conversation at some point with Pilate. What in the world? This is just... So Pilate threatens their plan here, which I think is hilarious. So they, they stirred up the crowd to have him, in order to have him release for them Barabbas instead. So I want to I pause here on Barabbas for just a second. And I want us to see the substitutions that are going on. All right, so if you, have, if you have been around Bible study for very long, you know that who is our substitute for our sin? Jesus. There we go. All right, great. Simple answer. Who did the chief priest propose to be the substitute for Jesus? Barabbas. So while Jesus is offering himself to be the substitute to God for Barabbas' sin, the chief priests take the inappropriate offering and substitute for the real offering. Barabbas plays this really weird role because he takes on him this focus from the religious elite to be anything else than Jesus. Like they were happy with somebody who was grouped together with insurrectionists and murderers. And what I have been told several times in my life is that when we take what God has made plain in the scripture and set it aside, anything else will do. 
And I find it deeply troubling and ironic that this religious elite wanted someone who either had directly committed murder or was associated with murderers to go free because they were committing murder at the time. You see, you don't like to be reminded of your own sin. I, like, I don't like to be reminded of my own sin. And when I see my sin in somebody else, I usually get one or two reactions. Either, hoity-toity boy, you are just, a, you know, or, well, that's not so bad. No big deal. Don't worry about that. It's no big deal, right? And I got to wonder if this is what's kind of going through some of these chief priests' minds is, it's no big deal. We're doing the same thing, right? I mean, we just, we literally just paid off Judas, like, 24 hours ago. <laughs> so I want you to, this is one of the reasons I love Barabbas, because he, he teases out this concept of substitution so easily for us to be able to see what's going on. Yes, ma'am. Oh, yes. I could not have. Yes. The disciples themselves did not get it. Right. What did what did Peter use in the garden the night before? The sword. It's what he saw. It's what he grew up in. This was his culture. Let's go to the next slide. This is who the disciples were. This is the list of 12 as they show up in Mark's gospel. So Peter always shows up first in every list. Simon Peter, first in every list. But there was another Simon. Simon the Zealot. You know what Zealot means? Go back one slide, Dave. Revolter. Someone who was uh, the, the, the modern translation, if zealot hadn't become such a part of that Simon's name, we would use the word terrorist. Someone who was willing to actively participate in violence to overthrow the Roman government. It is very, very likely that if, let's go to the next slide, if Simon was in the crowd, that he would have been torn as to which way to cheer. Because Barabbas would have been a hero to Simon. And we have all these conversations in the gospel about, well, when are you going to take over, Jesus? When are you going to, like, can we serve in your kingdom? Where do I get to sit? What, what, what role do I get to play? Like, they're, they're lining up cabinet-level positions, and he hasn't even taken over the country. Like, that's not right now, guys. Like the part of the prophecy that we're in right now is where I die and where I sat and sacrificed for you. Not the part where we rule and reign. That comes later. So I, I just wanted us to be very aware that even in Jesus' 12, you know, we got the one that's full on 100% traitor, betrayer. But Simon the Zealot either shows up as next to last or next to next to last in every single list of the 12 apostles. And this is by hierarchy, guys. Order matters. So that even the other apostles, when they stuck him here, when the Holy Spirit put him there, it's communicating something. His political ideology was not aligned with Jesus's, at least not at the beginning. And all this from Barabbas, right? I love getting to tease this stuff out. So let's keep going to verse 12. And Pilate, again, yep, okay, got it. And Pilate, again, said, and this is the imperfect tense, to them, this is to the crowd, then what shall I do to the man you call the king of the Jews? Am I the only one that feels like Pilate is trying to bend over backward to like, get out of this? Like it, it just, the, the funny thing is, of all the historical record that we have of Pilate, um, 
like Philo and Josephus are ruthless to this guy. I mean, they, they make him look like he is uh, Stalin of just the, he just crushes this and crushes, I mean, it's just all kinds of evil. The gospel writers are actually the kindest of all the historical records to Pilate because he tries to get out of crucifying and killing Jesus Christ, who is the hero of the gospels themselves, right? So he uses his favorite phrase for Jesus again. And again, verse 13, they cried out. And this is the, this is the, um, the, the, the actually the Greek word for screaming. I mean, this, the, the crowd is whipped up into a fury, and they are screaming out this word, crucify. But this word for cried out, it's an interesting word in Mark's gospel. In 311, um, the demons scream out like this. In 55, someone who is possessed screams out like this. In 924 and 926, or I'm sorry, in 924, the father who has a child who has a demon cries out to Jesus. In 926, the demon in the child cries out. So it, it does not have a really good uh, <laughs> history of usage in Mark's gospel, right? The, the, the most positive usage is in 1047 and 1048. This is blind Bartimaeus who screams out to Jesus, hey, 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 I know who you are. <laughs> have mercy on me, right? So they cried out again, crucify him. And I, I, want to, um, I want to spend a lot of time on the word, next week on the word crucify and the word scourged. Because we're, we're going to begin to kind of round the corner into the physical component of Jesus' crucifixion and what actually went on in this chapter. Um, but cruci- we'll just talk about crucifixion for just a second. So the crowd is not asking, make sure we understand this, this is an imperative. The crowd is not asking Pilate to crucify, the, cr- the crowd is telling Pilate to crucify him. So you're given a choice between Barabbas who's hanging out with the thugs and the murderers in the insurrection, or Jesus, who has, like, can you name one violent thing that Jesus does? That's right. He threw a table. But where did he throw that table? In the temple, right. And whose house? It's his house. Whose house did they think it was? They thought it was their house. Right? So you come into my house and you tip over a table and my wife is going to be deeply displeased. I will be very confused for a couple of minutes. My wife is going to be very deeply uh, displeased and she will uh, tell me to have you leave. Um, like that, is, that is what we are going to do. But if you come into our sanctuary at church and the communion table is set up, and you go flip that over, I don't know that my response is going to be meek and mild. Like that feels like you have kind of spit in our face at that point. Right? So th- this is how the religious elite would have seen this, was a direct affront on them in their house opposing what they're doing. And if you play this out, so if Jesus doesn't get crucified, what happens six months, nine months, 12 months, 10 years later? He only grows in popularity, and they only shrink. He continues to get more popular, bigger following. They only shrink. They've got to cut this off. And to people who had deep, deep, deep experience with death, and the priests did, if you don't think they did, just like read Leviticus, right? It was fundamentally a massive part of their job just to kill things on a very regular basis. They knew what death was. They stirred up the crowd to crucify Jesus. And the crowd was swayed. Partly because this is what their political bent was and partly because this is their religious leaders. And they cried out, 
crucify him. Now, I'll leave you with one more thought. Who was Jesus crucified with? Two robbers. Do you know what happened to accompany those who were insurrectionists? Opportunists who saw in many insurrections an opportunity to put something in their pocket in the middle of an insurrection and to steal. And most of the theologians believe that the two robbers were actually part of Barabbas' gang. And had Pilate not intervened in Barabbas, there would have been three crucifixions that day, but Barabbas would have been on the middle cross, not Jesus. So you got to wonder about how Barabbas lived the rest of his life. Like what? And we, we, the crazy thing is we have nothing in any historical document, in any church father's writing, in any reference to anything else about Barabbas after this. He just drops off the scene. Now, he may have gone back to the revolting and the insurrectioning, or he may have become a follower of Jesus Christ. I think I would want to know a little bit about somebody that was the substitute for me in my death, right? Somebody tell me something, <laughs> but we have no idea. I'd love to meet him one day, though. Like, what was that day like? The scene is painted as such that is, they have Barabbas and Jesus out in public and like, pick one of the two here. And the crowd picks. And we are still left with the choice of Barabbas or Jesus. Every single day, it's Barabbas or Jesus. And I hope we choose wisely. All right. There's not a real clean place to stop this lesson, so I'm just going to drop anchor right here and say that's that. Um, but I do want to make sure we have time to ask our question, what is God doing in you through his word from the portion of Mark we've studied so far? It should be fairly obvious what he's doing in me, um, beating me up about Barabbas again. Yes, sir? Okay. So you have these... When Dave starts off with okay, <laughs> it's been building up. Oh, <laughs> Yeah, we, we, can make, um, we can make anything our idol. Absolutely. Right? Uh, power, prestige. And uh, idols don't serve us. Ever. They only ever take, and they never give. Yeah. And, I, just, uh, I just don't see the fruits of the Spirit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you, you're going to find a... A, uh, a shocking lack of fruit of the Spirit in the first few verses in uh, Mark 15, right? Um, shocking, shocking. Yeah, good deal. All right, anybody else? What's God doing in you? Sorry, I need to look on the... No? no, no, you're good. You're good. What is God doing in you through his word from the portion of Mark we've studied so far? Let's let it keep working us over, uh, as that is good for us. So you should have a uh, weekly update on your table. So if you would grab that. 
and uh, take a moment and pray over a section or two there. If you've got any prayer requests, please record those. Uh, I don't say this every week, but those of you online, if you have any prayer requests, if you'll just put those in the comment section, we'd love to engage and pray over those as well. Uh, and then once you have uh, prayed over that, you are free to go and to worship this one. Who was still the substitute? Despite every effort from the religious leaders to have a different substitute, Jesus was still doing exactly what the Father desired him to do, which I think is just a beautiful picture of his commitment to obedience in uh, submitting his will to the Father's. So with that, thanks for coming today, guys. Thanks for engaging. And don't forget to subscribe to our podcast, YouTube channel, and weekly email. You can subscribe to all three of those at OurSundaySchool.com. Grace and peace to you.